So, now I want to introduce to you our speaker. And as you know, if you've been here in the past, we've had really great speakers. So every year we're putting our brains together and saying, wow, we need, we need it to be good. If people come because the speaker is always fantastic. And um, we got it right this time, for sure. So Todd Zakrizek, I first went to one of his sessions at the Lilly Conference on College Teaching about four years ago. And this was before I knew he was such a leader in the field. He was just doing one of the breakout sessions. I was like, he is so dynamic and so engaging, and everything he says is, is grounded in the research and such a good model for me as I do my own work. I thought, we need to bring him to Temple, and I'm so glad he decided to join us. Todd is the founding director of a few teaching and learning centers, including, I think, Central Michigan and Southern Oregon. Um, he was most recently executive director of the Teaching and Learning Center at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He is the director of the International Teaching and Learning Cooperative and leads the Lilly Conferences on College Teaching. He's just been a, a wonderful um, leader in the field of teaching and learning and faculty development. He has most recently joined the faculty in the um, Department of Family Medicine, also at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. So we are just thrilled that he decided to join us here at Temple, and welcome to Todd Zakrizek. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think I, I'm going to go with this microphone right here. So can you hear me okay? Is this all right? It's working and everything? I've got two microphones. One's for the camera here. Um, the camera operator, I've already ad ad advised, I move around a lot, so I won't be standing right behind the lectern, so i got to move around a little bit. And, uh, and if at any point you can't really hear me, just wave your hand. A couple of really quick housekeeping things at the very beginning. Number one is um, I like haven't had any coffee yet today. Uh, every time I teach, I get really geeked about teaching, and I still remember a student of mine one time, a returning student, it was an evening class, and she came up and she said, um, Dr. Z, you have a lot of energy, but if you really don't slow down, you're going to burn yourself out. And I told her, I said, I know eventually it's going to burn out, and I, I can't stop it, though. And now that was in 1986. So I'm still thinking as possible I'll burn out, but I'm also wondering if, if the burnout will be when I start slowing down. So I just kind of like to kind of keep that energy going. But I'm going to do this whole thing today kind of like the way I teach my classes. So that's how I wanted that framework. A um, little quick thing on this, which is really strange to me. I'm a first-generation college student. I went off to Lake Superior State College. I got my bachelor's degree. I was going to be a police officer, which came in handy last night because I got a ride in a Philadelphia police car. Um, uh, and I was looking for the Wendy's. You have the nicest police officers. <laughs> He says, it's raining, jump in, I'll drive you. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. Uh, but I was going to be a police officer, and then I kind of switched to psychology. Then I ended up being an associate professor. I mean, I got out to Southern Oregon. I got promoted. I got tenure. I then rescinded tenure to go to Central Michigan University to build a teaching center because I just love teaching and learning kinds of things. Did that for seven years. A friend of mine, Ed Neal, called me and he said the opening that we're going to rebuild, completely rebuild the center at um, UNC Chapel Hill. I'm thinking I'm a first generation college student. I barely get by. Imposter syndrome. I Probably nobody in here has that. Um, in academe, imposter syndrome runs rampant. I figured I would never get it. The reason I'm telling you this is 30 years, I wanted you to know how supportive my wife is. I go for the interview. I come back. They called me. I answered the phone. They said, we'd like to offer you the job leading the center at the revision at UNC Chapel Hill. I told my wife, they just offered me the job. She says, only in America could you get a job teaching teachers how to teach at a school you could never have gotten into. <laughs> so, that was so cool. So I, I did that. And this is all, I kind of giving you the framework here because you're going to see this coming out a lot in the presentation today. Um, after building this, I love building things. And so I got the center up, hired nine people in three years. Everything's rolling along pretty well. And someone in the School of Medicine said, I wish we had something in the School of Medicine like this. So I said, well, you know, we could talk through this. And in the end, I got hired. And now my appointment is in family medicine. And I'm actually building resources for teaching and learning in the School of Medicine still at Chapel Hill. And so... The only sad part is, and, and I wish this wasn't being videotaped, but I'm going to go out. Nah, never mind. Catch me after the break. I got a great joke I can't tell anymore. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I'm just going to go ahead and say it because I'm that gutsy. People keep asking me, are you a real doctor? And I say, yes, I am not a physician. 
Okay. <laughs> now, that's for all of your friends who keep asking you for a real doctor because the PhD. Okay, so for today, so we got a few things to play around with. I think the easiest way to get started here is just to quickly mention a difference, and, and the slides are up here mostly for me to keep track of where I'm at. Um, what I'd like to do today in a very short period of time is go through some critical aspects of teaching and learning, just some of the really challenges that we all face. What I'm hopeful and my goals for today is if you leave here with some ideas that you can implement in your classroom like immediately, you go back to your office and sit down and think, you know, I could really redo this a little bit. I've been doing this now for the teaching learning stuff for about 15 years, been teaching for a little over 20 or about 20 now. Um, Here's the concept I'm after. Whenever I go to a workshop like this, for the relatively new people, I'm hopeful that you will learn from your colleagues, you'll learn some things from me, and you'll be jotting some things down 99 miles an hour. For those of you who have been teaching for quite a while, what I'm really hopeful is that to some extent you'll say, wow, my colleague has a slightly different way of looking at it than I've done in the past, so I'm going to adapt and change that. At other times, I think what I'm hopeful for is you say, I used to do something like that, and I quit a while ago, and I don't know why, so I'm going to bring it back again because there's so many different things that we do that we sometimes just things drift away. The biggest thing I'm going to put out there, and I don't want to offend anybody in the room, but it's just something I've kind of come to realize for myself, the number of years teaching does not mean expertise in that. The number of years doing anything doesn't mean expertise at that thing. It means that you're very, very proficient and you do it very easily maybe because you do it a lot, but it doesn't mean we're an expert at it. And I got this out of Willingham's book, and I love this little scenario that he was, he was explaining. Um, Willingham had a great book called Why Students Don't Like School. You can drive every day of your life, but that doesn't make you a professional driver. And if there's a really big issue that comes up with a car, it doesn't mean that if your car goes into a power skid that you can drive out of it because you've driven every day of your life. You might actually read every day of your life, but it doesn't make you a professional reader. You might watch movies all the time, but it doesn't make you a professional critic. People who are professionals that really work at their profession work at their profession. And I like to set that up for today, not to offend anybody. I don't mean to offend anybody in here, but it's my thought that I have to go into when I walk into a room and start learning new things about teaching and learning. I realize I've been doing this for over 20 years, but it doesn't mean that I'm specifically a professional. I hope I'm getting pretty darn close and I keep working at it, but I, I want to just get away from that caution from somebody that says, oh, I've been teaching for 30 years, I know everything. I, that actually scares me a little. So kind of today is a day to work at this stuff, which I think is really fun. Big one is teaching versus learning. Um, there's this big move that's happened, and I'm not going to spend any real time on this one because hopefully most of you understand this one or we're getting it. A while back, there used to be this whole focus on teaching. How do you teach well? What are the teaching strategies? And all of a sudden, 15 years ago or so, people started getting really more concerned about learning. And there's a big difference between teaching and learning. And the one that I like to point out is if you are a teaching-centered person, one of the best ways or easiest ways to figure that out is if you can walk into a classroom and teach your class, and if there were no students, it would look about the same, then you're a very teaching-centered person. And for me, and I'm going to tell you, a lot of this stuff directly replies, or comes right back to me. I was a very good lecturer, I was told. I've taught some huge classes, not huge classes. Uh, my biggest semester was three sections of intro psych with 200 each. So I haven't taught more than 200 students at a time, but 200, and they were back-to-back -back classes. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 to 10, 10 to 11, and then 12 to 1. I did have a one-hour break in there. And by the way, after I taught those three classes in that same semester, I had a behavior modification class and a cognitive psych class. So five courses. And for support, I had one undergraduate TA. But what I would do is I would walk into those big lecture halls and I would teach. And then I would leave. And if the lecture hall was empty, the class would have looked very, very similar. Now what happens is I go in and I remind myself every day I go in for what do I need my students today? And it's a kind of a neat thing to go through in my head for what do I need my students today? Well, I need them today to help me to help the group understand the distribution of, um, oh, you know what? Central limit theorem would be good. Distribution of sample means. Oh, yeah, that'd be a fun one. By the way, I do teach inherently interesting topics. I have 
Statistics and the History of Psych, two of the best courses ever. Um, I need my students to help me because we're going to try some sampling and we're going to do some different things in class and by the end of the class period we're all going to understand distribution of sample means but I would have a harder time doing that without the students than I would with the students. So that point there of just getting the students involved, it's a big thing. All right, now, here's what I'd like to try next. I'm going to see if I can do this. We go right back to Ferris here. I know several of you have seen this, but I'm going to play with this. Controlled House of Representatives, an effort to alleviate the effect of the anyone, anyone, the bill, the Holly Smooth Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised. Tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue from the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effect? It did oh, not work. The United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is? Class? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone have seen this before? The Laffer curve. Anyone know what this says? It says that at this point, on the revenue curve, you will get exactly the same amount of revenue as at this point. This is very controversial. Does anyone know what Vice President Bush called this in 1980? Anyone? Something D-O-O -O economics. Movie economics. All right, so that's... The reason I like to show this one is we have a responsibility. So teaching challenges. How do we get the point across to students? We could stand up there and do that. I'm going to come back to this in just a second, but I just handed out some pennies. So I need your help on this. Please. Everybody take a sheet. If you need a sheet in a second, let me know. But here's the big one before you even get rolling. Please do not look at a penny, iPhone a penny, Google a penny, Bing a penny, or anything else. Your first task is just to look at this and working totally in isolation, that means by yourself without anybody helping you. Please take a look at this and see if you can identify which of these is the correct U.S. penny. And I'll explain in just a second why I'm doing this. Others, anybody else need one here? Nope. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, all by yourself. Looking for the right U.S. penny here. Yes. Oh, there you go. Sure. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, again, don't. Now, when, when you found the penny that you think you like, either circle the penny or write the letter down. Somehow make a commitment to it, but don't share it with your neighbor yet. Oh, sure. Don't share it with your neighbor yet. And don't look in your pockets yet. This is hard to control and all. All right. As you're looking at pennies, I'm going to tell you right now, the reason I'm doing this thing is that you've looked at pennies thousands and thousands of times. I try to come up with different ways of getting across different points. Number one of them I have a hard time with my students is mere repetition will not get things into long-term memory. Oh, sure. Yep. I guess we have a microphone issue, so I'm going to try doing this one. Um, mere repetition alone will not get you to get materials into long-term memory. It takes something else. Everyone's looked at pennies thousands and thousands of times. So let's try this real quickly. Everybody hopefully by now has a, has a penny. Now. If you're having really hard time narrowing it down to two pennies and it's really, really bothering you, that's sad. Um, it's not that big a deal. If you've looked at your neighbors to see what they've got so you can see if it's the same as yours, wait a minute, that's, don't tell, no, 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 get, no, I said no pennies. <laughs> okay, now, <laughs> no pennies. Now, here we go, real quick, I gotta go through this one. All right, so first things first. Um, how many, let, I'm gonna ask you how many think A, how many B, how many C, how many D? Raise your hand when you get to the penny. Please don't look around the room and think, oh, I wonder if anybody else picked L. Be proud of your response, <laughs> all right? So here we go, how many A's? Raise your hand real fast, a few A's. Okay, good, B's, good, C's, 
D's, no D's, E's, good, F's, a couple F's, good, G's, lots of G's, good, H's, excellent, I's, oh, lots, J's, got it, K's, good, K's, L's, L's, okay, good, M's, several M's, N's, a couple N's, O's, a couple O's, okay, anybody believe that none of the above might be right? Why would you say none of the above? I just told you one of them was right. I, just, I wouldn't lie to you. I, I keep burning through this, but I, I had one person one time who said, none of these are correct because these are only representations of pennies. There's no actual pennies there. I see some nodding. You know what discipline would say such a thing? Exactly. Good for you. It was a philosopher. Very good. And I got to tell you, right at that moment, all I could think of is I looked at the person and said, oh, philosopher, huh? Well, we all know philosophers are just psychologists without data. Um, <laughs> we laughed and laughed. <laughs> he actually gave me a book at the end, and he wrote, To the Data Man. And I think it was sarcasm. <laughs> okay, so you raised your hands on these. I'll tell you what I would like to do, and we have to move really, really fast because we don't have a whole lot of time here, but at your tables, could you please chat amongst yourselves in literally two or three minutes, see if you can come to a general consensus on which penny you would pick as a table. The whole table try to agree in literally like two, maybe three minutes most. Okay, we better stop there. I know you're just getting rolling. Okay. So the next step, what we're going to do here, and by the way, as I go through this, I'll use a lot of different techniques for different things, and the one I should point out real fast is how to bring a class back, especially a large class, if everybody is talking and you want to get their attention back. Um, I, I try to do almost everything I do in the class somewhat mindfully, and I'm, I'm doing a journal right now and several other things on evidence-based teaching and learning, evidence influence teaching and learning. I would encourage you to look for evidence and look for what's out there, almost every aspect of teaching, not all at once, pretty overwhelming, but think through every little aspect of it. When you get a conversation rolling like this, to get a group of almost 200 people to stop talking, there's a lot of different techniques. And by the way, don't look at a penny yet. Um, <laughs> So I saw some, a table back here start to raise their hands. So that's a really good technique. There's one that you can tell your students if you're teaching last class or a teaching a large class is say, if you see any hand in the room up, raise your hand and stop talking. Now if you've got people who have their back to me and the person up here raises their hand or in the back of the room raises their hand because they see me start to raise my hand, you're looking in the back of the room, you see a hand go up, you put your hand up and you stop talking. I've had classes of 200 that will stop talking within like five, six seconds. I heard another one just recently I really liked. It goes like this. 
Play along if you'd like here. It goes like this. If you can hear my voice, clap your hands once. If you can hear my voice, clap your hands twice. If you can hear my voice, clap your hands three times. And I watched a person do that with class of about 40, and she could stop conversations immediately. And she wouldn't do it three times. She would just go until everybody was clapping. And toward the end of a session, she was saying, if you hear my voice, clap once. People would, half the room would clap once, and she'd stop and say, okay, next step. And it was a real hard stop, let's move on. So there's neat ways of doing this. I used a technique I like to call blabbering or just kind of chatting. I just started talking. I said, okay, well, that's about it for now. Let's move on. I didn't say anything for about 30 seconds. And as I was just talking through a little bit there, there were people who were stopping. But the reason I did that is it lets people finish the task. If I do the everybody clap or raise your hands, you're done just like this. If you're trying to come to a quick discussion or a decision and I just talk a little bit, then people can say, ooh, ooh, we got to hurry up. So which one do you want? And it gives you a few seconds. So I guess my point is there's just different ways of ending kind of a discussion time. By the way, you get your students talking so much that you have to struggle with getting them to stop, you're in a really good place. So because it's not often the problem, the bigger problem will be getting them to start talking. So, okay, so back to our task. For a task, now what I'm curious about is how many people after talking, generally for the tables, how many people at the tables and stuff did you talk a lot about, and, you, and I'm gonna go through the coins real fast, was A a big topic of conversation? How many tables for A? Whoa, that's big. How B's? B's, okay. C's? D's? E's? F's? There was E's. F's? G's? Lots of conversation with G's. H's? I's? Good. J's? Okay. K's? L's? Several L's. Okay, good. M's? N's and O's. Okay. Real quick thing looking around the room. Number one, lots more variability than we started, which would make sense because you've had groups of talking. But what happens after you start these discussions is people immediately say, well, I think it could be A or G, but I'm not sure which. And someone else says, well, I think it's A or L, but I'm not sure which, but I know it's not G. And as you start talking back and forth, you start combining ideas. The next thing you know, you're kind of coalescing on a point. A is actually the right answer. So A is the one, that's the coin. Good deal. All right, now, I'll move on, but there is one couple of things I need to do to wrap up with this. Number one is I still didn't say look at a penny, <laughs> but that's okay, you can now. Go ahead and look at a penny. But several of you already started to. Here's the part I find interesting. Number one, several of you have been dying to look at a penny from the moment I said don't look at a penny, even independent of the activity. See, this is the one thing I've learned about faculty, and it's about myself a long time ago, too. We don't like to be told what to do. I'm pretty convinced that if a provost came out and said, um, because fiscally we're all in sound condition, every one of you are going to get $1,000 extra bonus pay this year, and there's nothing you can do about it. Do you feel that? Oh, wait a minute. I was happy with $1,000. What do you mean there's nothing I can do about it? <laughs> And so then that comes a whole other point. So there's that kind of thing. In the classroom, you get the same thing. By the way, we're just big students. Um, you know, we all were students, and that's, we have that framework going on in our heads. But with students, we get the same thing. Some of them, as soon as they're told, you can't do this, you must do that, that same thing, just remember that comes up in their mind too. The other one is, some of you, even though I said it was A, you were just compelled to look at a penny. I don't know that that means you don't trust me. It's like, I want confirmatory evidence. You know, we've been teaching people for a long time that you should get evidence for things. Don't rely on somebody just telling you something. So there's several people that do that. There, by the way, there's some of you who are perfectly happy to say, oh, hey, pretty cool, and move on. You're willing to accept an authority's statement of A is the right response. So the point is, there's lots of different things going on with this. Most importantly, why is this a hard task? Everybody should be able to pick out a penny. You've seen them thousands of times. So I'll ask you real quickly, what makes it hard to find the real penny? Lots of distractors. They're very good distractors. And they're close, aren't they? If I had put down a penny, a nickel, a dime, and a quarter, and said, which one's a penny? Most people say, uh, this one right here. Uh, it wouldn't be a hard task. I like to actually give this to my students on the first day of class. And I use, the first thing I explain to them is, in life, distractors can look a lot like the thing we're after. So don't tell me that I have picky questions. What I have are highly selective questions. 
I want to know if you know something. I don't want to know if you can pick a penny out of a, a pocket full of change. I want to know if you can tell a real penny from a fake penny. That's a different kind of task. In psychology, I want to know if you know the nuances. So that's a huge one. Lots of distractors. A couple other quick things. So why else would we have a hard time with this? Details. details? Okay, good. What about details? Many details. There's similar details. All right, so similar details, which is a lot like the distractor one, so that's good. But some other stuff? Yes, way in the back. Got it. But we can tell a penny when we see one. How would we possibly do that? Details. Right. Yeah. So what do we need to tell when something's a penny? Details? No, no. no. <laughs> if, if I threw a handful of change onto a table and said, how many pennies? It's all U.S. coins. Boom. How many pennies? You all could say, bam. Just like this what? Color and size. Color and size, right? It's this big around and it's copper color. Mm -hmm. If we see that, we know it's a penny. So one of the big tasks for today I just want to put across there is your brains are all wired in a very, very similar way. You process information until you have it. And once you can make a logical decision about something, you stop. If you don't stop, we put you into a DSM category as a psychologist. <laughs> and as my daughter years and years ago said, oh yeah, that's CDO. And then we were chatting about this. And I said, what? She said, I have a little bit of CDO. And I said, I don't get CDO. She said, CDO, you don't, you're a psychologist, dad. You don't get it? And I said, no, no. She said, oh, I'm so sorry. You probably call it OCD. But seriously, it should be alphabetical. Um, <laughs> I always love that one. <laughs> so the concept here is that if you keep processing over and over and over again, even though you have something, that's bad for us. So now here's the real thing for all of you and all of your students. The receiver of the information is the one who decides if she or he has enough information. If you decide you have enough information, you stop processing so you're not in that OCD category. We all do that all the time. Do you want to know how to get from here to Wendy's? I'm just going to make this up because I have no clue. I could, though, start with something like go out the front door. When you go out the front door, there's going to be a series of about four or five trees, and there's a building across the street, and the building has got this name on it. And what I need you to, to turn left then, and as you turn left, you're going to see that the bricks aren't all in a row. They're kind of wobbly a little bit. And as you walk down through there and get to the next, you're, you're sitting back saying, whoa, seriously, so so far what I have is go out the building and turn left. So your brain's starting to shut down and say, what's the nuance here? What is the thing? Now, the reason this is all important for all of us, imagine a coin collecting conference. They would look at this sheet and say, well, A is the closest approximation, but it's not exactly right. And then they would explain why it wasn't exactly right. We're not coin collectors, so only about 10 of you out of 200, maybe 15 of you, got the right coin out of this because it's not what we do. Novices in your classroom will shut down way sooner than you want them to. So what I do is I do a task like this. You could pick out a different task. Pick out a task that's got some details in it, and it could be just about anything, and show them this. And if they should know the answer, but they have a hard time with the detail, if they can do the global but not the detail, what I tell them in my class, this big in copper will not get you through the course. If I ask you to do five homework problems, I have picked the five homework problems for a reason. Please do all five. Don't do the first two and say, all right, I got it, I'm done. I had a student one time, the stats geeks in here will understand. I had a student one time tell me, you know, that formula that you have for independent sample t-test is way too complicated. All you do is take the mean for the group, first group minus the mean for the second group, divide by four, and if it's above the critical value in the table, it's significant. I said, but what about all the pooled error variants? She says, I've done this like 10 times, Dr. Z. It works out every time. <laughs> she had figured out this great system. Of course, the next test, what I did is I included a press question that that didn't work. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't. I told her ahead of time, this is what's going to happen here. But the issue is she had figured this out real fast. So one of the things I do differently on my homework assignments now, because experts and novices do things differently, I ask the students to point out the details to me. So this is a really, really important one. Experts see things and they just get it. They see the beauty of it. They understand the interworkings of it. Novices don't. They look at things and they don't see it. That's why your students often don't find something as exciting as you do. They're looking at it saying, I don't understand why you get all excited about this. You get excited because you see details. So what I now do, and there's good research behind this, if you have five homework problems, for instance, assign them four instead of five and make the fifth question, why do you think I assigned these four to you? 
Now in statistics, what that might boil down to is calculating variance. And what I want the students to say is, oh, I can see you change the range and you stand, change the sample size and you are getting me to understand the difference between range, or the influence of range and sample size on variance, something like that. That'd be a great answer. If I'm doing something just on the concept of classical conditioning, what's a condition stimulus, what's a condition response, what's an unconditioned stimulus, give me one example in your life and why am I asking you, why did I ask you this set of questions? And students start looking through those for those threads and those nuances and it changes the, the views of the class completely. That's changing over to more learning centered. What can I do to make sure the students are getting it? What can I do to get the students doing things together? Huge difference. Um, I just want to pitch this up here real quickly because I just, it's one of my favorite graphs ever. If you can't see it because of the pillars, uh, you can scooch out a little bit here. Um, Hake did this and, and Basically, this represents 6,000 data points. And essentially what this boils down to is he went in, and it was pretty loose research kind of thing. It's really hard to control all little variables. But what he did is he looked at interactive engagement, classes that had some amount of interactivity versus a traditional class. You walk in, you lecture, and you walk out. Um, Wilhelm Wundt, 1879, writes about this idea of teaching, or one of his students wrote about him, actually. In the late 1800s, the person who founded psychology had a lecture auditorium, and what he would do, I love this, this description, he would slowly shuffle into the auditorium across the stage in full academic regalia, five graduate students walking behind him. As he passed the first row, the five graduate students peeled off and sat into five pre-assigned seats. Professor Wundt would then go to the lectern, and he would deliver his talk. At the end of his talk, he would turn, and as he walked out, the five graduate students would stand up and file back out with him. And of course, this allowed the graduate students to see what he had said so they could talk to the students. That was not an interactive classroom. But that's considered truly traditional. Although we don't do this, how many times we see colleagues who will go in, teach a class, and say, if you have any questions, come see me in my office hour and walk out. In my head now, I always think I should have professional, my, my academic regalia on and walk in and walk out. That's the total traditional. Interactive is anything getting students involved. So I'm going to try to do this really fast. This is only pretest, post test. This doesn't account for all of those other things that happens in interactivity. Pretest on the content, then he gave a post test. Post test minus the pretest was the gain. If the, and each one of these symbols is an entire course. It's not a person, it's a course. If on the pretest, the entire course scored an 80, and if on the post-test the course scored 100, the entire course, the class, would have a 20-point gain and they'd be on this black line. So this black line up here represents the most gain you can possibly have. The fact there's no symbols up there is fine. It just means the post-test didn't have 100%. We don't want them to have 100%, then we have a ceiling effect. All we're after is just generally the squares are high school, circles are college, and the triangles are universities. But all you need to worry about from the back are these lighter greenish kind of colors. Those are interactive. The reds are lecture. In looking at this, it's amazing. The best lecturers out there can keep up with the worst interactive classrooms out there. What's really amazing to me in terms of really moving me in thinking about this was that there were no lectures that were spattered amongst here. I would have expected one here and one here and maybe over here, something like that. Nope, they're all down here. And if you run a really bad interactive classroom, this is the part that just messes me up. If you run a really bad interactive classroom, you're right in the middle of all the lecturers. And the reason this happens, the evidence is coming out over and over and over again, is that the by and large, the information that's being transmitted through a lecture is not held on to very long. And to get for an individual exam, oftentimes people will do okay, but this is pre-test, post-test. By the end of the semester, most of it's gone. You need some way to solidify that information. So I like to throw this up here because it's really good data. Again, there's 6,000 data points in there. So how do we do this? There's lots of things we can do. I already showed you the, the clip on Ferris Bueller. You know what's funny about that clip? Is that Ferris Bueller is just asking a bunch of rhetorical questions. He doesn't expect the students to respond. So as they're out there non-responding, it's kind of what you expect. Today, we don't have students sleeping with their head. I wish we do have students sleeping. Um, 
and staring off into space. But we also have a lot of them with their mobile devices. This is also a really cool thing. We have never, I just want to point this out really fast. We've always had distractions. This is a visual distraction, but please keep in mind, if it really frustrates you that students are typing on their laptops or working on their mobile phones, this isn't reassuring, just think about this. They've always been disengaged. It's just now you can see it. If you switch it a little bit, that means we're at an advantage over 20 years ago. See, 20 years ago, if I was in your class, you might be talking and I might be going like this. As you're telling me about biochemistry, I'd be going, oh, this is good. And that all looks great, right? I'm taking notes, I'm looking at you. What you don't know is what I might be doing. I might be thinking to myself, I hate biochemistry. I hate this instructor. I hate this class. I don't like anything about it. I think biochemistry is stupid. I am going to think about the perfect hamburger. Hmm, <laughs> hamburger. I would want some pickles. I like pickles. <laughs> now keep in mind, if you all think I'm writing about biochemistry, this is the, think, take away the verbal and just look at the nonverbal. It would look like this. Ooh, tomatoes. <laughs> tomatoes. Maybe I'll add a little bit of mayo. Hmm, cheese. Well done, I like cheese. <laughs> and if I'm doing that back and forth, it all looks like I'm taking notes and everything is fine. Nowadays, the problem is I'm doing the Blackberry prayer, or now the iPhone prayer, and if you haven't seen this in committee meetings, it looks like this. Actually, I'll do it in front of the lectern. Uh, I can do it right here, too. Imagine there's a table right here in front of me. This would work here. If I'm sitting at the table, I don't know why people think that they don't, others don't notice, and it looks a little like this. <laughs> and when people do that, it's like, okay, I, you know, just bring your device out. It's actually less noticeable, I'll grab the mic here, it's less noticeable, people don't get, students don't get this either, if they actually hold it up a little higher. In a lecture and auditorium, to hold it up a little higher and type like this, you don't notice as much, but when they chum it down like that's bad. But now we can see what they're doing. So one of the things I just want to point out here, and this is part of attention, if you don't have their attention, they won't learn. We all kind of know that, but please keep in mind that when they're not attending to something, it's extremely difficult for the brain to automatically process information it didn't attend to. That's the way our brains work. If you don't attend to it, it's gone. If it bothers you that there are cell phones and devices and, and, and laptops out and things, just please keep in mind real carefully what you do about that. If you say no laptops in this classroom, Actually, some new research coming out. People with ADD do way better in classes if they take notes on their laptops. So if you say no laptops in the classroom, you may very well be differentially discriminating against people with ADD. You're hurting them in the classroom. If you say, OK, everybody, you can use the um, laptops, but only for taking notes. Nah, that's funny. Um, <laughs> but you can try it. And what I like to do is, on the, you, you're in a perfect situation now, get the students to agree on the first day of class that that's what they'll do. By the way, this is so fabulous for the timing. Students on the first day of class will agree to almost anything because they have all kinds of optimism. Get them to commit so that later in the semester you can say, you know, we had that conversation on the first day and you said that you'd only use your laptop for taking notes. I noticed you've been watching a lot of YouTube clips in class. I'm just going to have to ask you to stop doing that. Asking or having that conversation is easier when everybody agreed on the first day of class, which they all believe that they'll only use their laptops for notes at that point. Um, sometimes, I heard this one just recently, I love it. Sometimes you can tag into it with uh, labs and see what they're looking at. Faculty member just told me literally like two days ago, he says he was looking through the things and a student was shopping for shoes. He didn't want to embarrass her in class and so he just typed, pick the war ed ones on the left, they're so cute. <laughs> And she immediately just shut her computer off. Um, but that's what you have to just think through a little bit. By the way, calling on people with devices. I now have device. I don't tell people they can't use them, but it's fair game. If you have the device open and I'm talking about something in class and we're working on it, and I say, oh, Tolman wrote cognitive purpose of behavior in animals and men. And I can't remember exactly when that was, but the era is important. Could you look up what year that was? And I've had some students, which I knew were not taking notes, will stop and look up and say, what? I'll say, um, just look up the year. I love to do this. And they say, the year, yeah, yeah, Tolman, Purpose of Behavior in Man. Oh, okay. And then they'll do it. So I let them off the hook a little bit. But the point is, I've caught them. I had a young lady just recently, she did that. I went back to teaching. 
I noticed that she was again chatting with her friend on the computer. So then I went back, asked her another question. She said, what? And I asked it again. She said, oh, okay, and looked it up. The third time I went to her, she actually looked at me as though she were disgusted, took the top of her laptop and went like this. Closed it. <laughs> It was like, if you're going to bother me, I might as well turn it off. I thought that was so perfect. And I was okay with that. It worked out. It was fine. Um, but by the way, and this is other, I'm just trying to pick up little tips about this as we go along too. If you're thinking to yourself, I wish I could see what they're doing though, please keep in mind, sometimes we don't catch what's obvious. You know what they're doing without looking at their screen. You don't need to walk around and catch them. Um, I'm going to go over here to the lectern. It's probably the easiest. Yeah, I think this will work. Should be designed. Okay, yep, we don't cut off too many people. If I'm working on my laptop, watch this. Got my laptop open. If I'm looking at you and typing, that looks a lot like taking notes, right? But imagine me going like this during class. You do not need to see the screen. There is no way that anybody is taking notes. Classical conditioning, there's an unconditioned stimulus and a conditioned stimulus. The unconditioned stimulus, when paired with a neutral stimulus, will elicit a conditioned response. <sighs> when that elicited response then goes, no, that doesn't, that's not what it looks like at all. So you know that that's what's happening. If a person's looking at a screen and going like this, there is no way they're taking notes. That's either a game or it's shopping. If a person goes like this, and the person over here goes, oh. <laughs> that's not notes. We know that's not notes. And my favorite one, of course, is if somebody is just looking back going like this and looking at their screen and their friends are all looking at the screen and they're kind of laughing and, and looking off the side, they're watching YouTube clips. So you, most of you are parents. Use your parenting skills. <laughs> and we know about the pipeline, right? If you find out what your kids are up to, but they don't know you know, that's the best scenario because it freaks them out a little bit. So I'll catch my students at time and I'll say, you know, on the first day of class we agreed that you'd only use your laptop for notes. You've been watching a lot of YouTube clips and I'd really appreciate it if you would stop that. And you watch their faces, it's so cool. It's like, how did you know I was watching YouTube clips? I said, you know, it's not important how I know, it's important that I know. <laughs> and it just it kind of works out. Okay, so the point is, think about that. By the way, here's one little quick tip. Uh, and it does not discriminate against people with all the uh, learning disabilities or learning challenges, is have tech-free times. You just say to your group, okay, everybody, we're going to have a tech-free discussion for 15 minutes. And at the 15-minute mark, you just start talking and say, okay, let's summarize what we talked about, everybody. And if they want to, they can pull their laptops back out. But the point is just thinking through how you got to do it. But the attention has to be there. Um, figuring out ways of getting their attention, it just in all different classes, there's different ways of doing this. But I, if you watch, if you haven't done it, watch a couple of TED Talks for the specific reason of the first 30 seconds. How did that person in 30 seconds convince me that this talk was worth listening to? And if you watch those, and not for the whole talks, just watch those chunks, you'll be amazed at what people will do. Um, classical conditioning. Okay, I could do something like this. Okay, everybody, I hope, uh, and I hope that would be a bad way to start it. Okay, everybody, you just read the chapter on classical conditioning, so let's get started. Um, you know, classical conditioning is kind of bizarre, isn't it? Under which circumstances could you actually learn something and have no, no control over it whatsoever? You walk into a bakery and you suddenly feel relaxed. You smell some Bengay and you suddenly feel all tensed and, and kind of geeked about something. You look over and see a certain person's face and it reminds you of somebody and immediately you feel nauseous. You feel nauseous. And, and yet you never wanted to do any of those things. How could that even happen? And all of a sudden we're kind of talking about classical conditioning a little bit. I could also, and I've done this before, whoops, go up and say, okay, today's classical conditioning. So you've read the chapter. Let's run through this real quickly. Unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned response. Conditioned stimulus, conditioned response. And I turn around and half of my students are sleeping. Just that fast. That's not a good start. So if you think about how do you introduce the topic, there's different ways of doing it. And those are your attention grabbers. There's another whole concept out there now, social contagion. There's cognitive neuroscience. Everybody's really ripped about cognitive neuroscience. There's some great stuff about that. You know what's really exciting me right now? Social neuroscience. Social neuroscience is the fact that we can interact as human beings and the interaction changes my physiology just by interacting. 
There's something called mirror neurons. There's still some arguments and discussions about mirror neurons, but basically what it boils down to is this. If this were a glass, and I take a glass, actually I've got an orange juice container, that's better. <laughs> if I take an orange juice container and take this juice and take a drink of it, as you watch me take a drink of that, mirror, uh, neurons fire in your brain that represent or are similar to what you just saw. The research is kind of cool because if we take a glass that's, that you can't see through and you pour water into it and take a drink, you can't see the glass at all. But while you're watching the videotape, I pour all the water out, set the glass down, pick it up again and take another kind of looks like a drink out of the glass, different neurons fire. Your brain knows whether there's water in that glass or not and as a result will fire differently. If you have recently, and I don't have the slide up here, I, uh, sorry, I was going to put it up there and forgot. If you recently see in a sporting event where somebody's leg is like broken in half, merely saying that just now caused several people to go, ooh, ah. <laughs> Showing the image makes a whole group go, ow. Right. Think about why that's happening. We're looking at something and it's, people will even say, ow. There's like this, you don't physically have a, a pain in your leg, but you're feeling this stuff. The reason this is all important is that we know that these things are changing how we interact. And so one of my favorites is social contagion. When people watch movies in a theater that's a comedy, they laugh more than when they're by themselves. We find things more interesting when there's people around us saying, ooh, that's interesting. Groups will actually generate interest of a topic. And it's contagious. So here's one, I didn't do this because I'm, I'm friends with all the temple folks, but sometimes I like to play with it. When I get asked to come in and do a presentation, I'll play with the people who ask me to come in, and I can do this one. It's kind of fun. Um, when you're talking about critically think, uh, critical aspects in teaching and learning, there's like 22 points that you need to really, really be thinking seriously about. Um, point number one <laughs> is, is the expert effect. Um, when you're an expert and your students are not experts, they have a hard time really seeing the beauty of the thing. So, you know, you gotta be an expert. And I could keep talking about that. And then I could go on to point number two. And if you can feel this in the room, it's pretty amazing. Within just a couple of seconds, I could take any energy in this room and just completely suck it out of here. <laughs> and I've actually walked by classrooms where people saying, Chemistry is the most fascinating field you're ever going to experience. <laughs> and I think to myself, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> but there's that concept. Now, I'm not saying that you have to run all over the room. That's the cool part. You don't, don't act like you're really overly excited at the point you're running. If you're truly interested in the topic, let that come out. So without really moving and jumping out of my skin or anything, what I can tell you is this. Do you know there's something called an inhibitory stimulus? An inhibitory stimulus is something in the environment that when present will stop you from doing something. Think about that for just a second. A stimulus that causes you to not do something. As a researcher, this is a graduate seminar, as a researcher, how would we know that a stimulus stops you from doing something when there's also neutral stimuli? And a neutral stimulus means that when you look at something that's neutral, you don't do anything. The neutral stimulus, you don't do anything because there's no conditioning. The inhibitory stimulus, you don't do anything because you've been conditioned to not do something. Now, when you look at maybe helping somebody and you have an inhibitory stimulus there, it's not neutral. You look at something going on and it's causing you to not help that person even though you want to because of prior learning. And if you could remove whatever that inhibitory stimulus was, you would fire right in and act and help them. How could we figure out the influence between those two things? In my mind, that's a little bit more energy and a little bit more interesting, although I'm not running all over the place. I know some of you are still saying it's psychology, it's boring, but still, catch a lot more people. So that, that concept of social contagion is huge, is how do we get across to our students that it's interesting? And I'll tell you one last thing about this topic. I teach statistics, I love statistics. Those of you who don't love statistics, I don't care, <laughs> unless you teach it. <laughs> and if you don't love it and you're teaching it, that's a problem. You might te be teaching a course that I don't understand and I don't really get and I don't think is exciting, but if you think it's exciting, that's great. The dilemma in education is when a person steps up into a classroom and they don't like what they're doing. And by the way, 
You can't really fake that. The students get it really, really quickly. So find that chunk. And there's so much leeway. Find the area that is exciting about it, and then you're the teacher. You get to go in those directions. So social contagion, attention grabbers are absolutely imperative for doing this because the emotions that come out of this stuff are really quickly transferable and can change very, very quickly. Okay, now, so we know that from research. Now I kind of got into that area a little more than I wanted to. Um, let's see. Just in case anybody's keeping track on the score sheet, that means I'm about two-thirds of the way through my time plus some questions and answers and I've managed to just turn to page two. Um, so let's, I wanted to set some things up there, but let me get moving here a little bit better and, and getting through some material here in terms of general information. Pastor McDaniel, Roar, and Bork, there's your homework assignment. If you have not, how many of you have actually read some article by Pastor called Learning Styles? Anybody in here read something like this? All right, how many of you have not raised your hand? All right, good, not checking. By the way, you'll notice that's mutually exclusive. How many of you have read it? How many have not read it? I do that because if I don't say how many have not read it, then a lot of people don't put their hands up and then I have some, some problem of knowing, did you not put your hand up because you don't like putting your hands up or did you not read it? And so I always do that. And by the way, if you keep doing that with students, you get a lot more response. But here's the deal with this. Four preeminent psychologists, Pashler, McDaniel, Rohr, and Bork. And by the way, Bob Bork has a Learning and Forgetting Lab site that is fabulous. Very easily accessible information, lots of links to some really cool stuff. Bob Bork. Um, these four individuals in psychology are like the kings of the whole thing. They're really, really up there. And what they were asked to do is please go out and summarize the research on learning styles. Specifically, what does meshing look like? Meshing is, I, you're a visual learner, so I teach visually. I use a lot of images. You're auditory learner, so I tell you good semantic stories that draw stuff in. You're kinesthetic learner, so basically what I do is kinesthetically, I have you do things, and that helps you to learn. They went through and they found thousands and thousands of articles talking about learning styles. My daughter in high school, six classes, she did four learning style inventories this year. Teachers love these things. The evidence, absolutely no evidence that meshing does anything. Now. This is, don't get disconcerted yet, because there's some really, it turns out we're doing the right thing, we're just potentially not doing it for the right reason. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because of the student more than the teaching. Here's the reason for this. Imagine for a moment that we do have, we, you took the inventories, your visual learners, your auditory learners, your kinesthetic learners. I show a really, really good graph up here. I'm showing you Monet's, how a Monet differs from a Manet. And here's a Monet photo uh, print, and I show you some nuances. The visual learners should say, okay, now I understand. The auditory learners would say, oh, please tell us in detail what this means. And the kinesthetic people should say, well, get us some paints and let us paint a little bit. And it doesn't make sense that that would happen. Everybody in the room should learn if it's a really good visual. If it's a really good kinesthetic task, everybody in the room learns. So the point is what happens in the end is that there are definitely learning preferences. And learning preferences is as you grow up, I really like looking at graphs, and I do. I love maps. My wife one time for a Christmas present actually bought me a really nice map of the US that I would just stare at for hours and think about trips we would do. I love maps. But if somebody tells me a really good anecdote, that works for me. If I do a really good hands-on type of thing, that works for me. The reason I'm telling you this, we should be mixing up the different modalities, but what you really want to watch out for is are you teaching in multiple modal, modal ways? We want some good vision, uh, vision uh, visuals. We want some good auditory, some good conceptual frameworks for pulling things together, and we want people to get in there and do things. We want them to do those. Most importantly is it should match the retrieval. If you're teaching music, your visual representations might be relatively limited. Yes, I understand you could show pictures of a clarinet, you could show fingerings of a clarinet, but there's not a lot you can do with that. Kinesthetic is huge for music. You need to play the clarinet. If you're doing something with painting, visual's pretty darn good. If you're doing different areas, chemistry, building models, doing molecules, you know, the kinesthetic stuff is fabulous. So when you think of retrieval, it's how do you want to encode it and pull it out that way. There's actually a joke video that's great. It's called something like Sir Dance-a-Lot and it's a lecture about dancing. And they've made such a good mockery of the concept, and it's the same kind of thing. 
It's the mixing up the modalities of free retrieval. And what this basically is is a teacher who's lecturing to a group about dancing. This is how this dance is, this is how this dance is, let me show you the steps. One of the students in the lecture auditorium stands up and starts to go like this. He said, please take your seat, we're in the middle of class. <laughs> and so the student sits back down and he does all of these descriptions and everything and it fast forwards through. He gets to the final exam and in the final exam he says, okay, everybody pick a partner and now do a salsa. <laughs> and at that point the basic response is, well, how would that even be possible because we haven't been able to practice in that, and they don't say it out loud, in that modality. So we have to be really careful when we're showing lots and lots of things or doing something and at the end say, okay, now do this. So we just something to be careful about. By the way, if you want to hit learning styles, be sure not to miss one of the best ones. This, this is from America's finest news source. Very good, I heard it already, The Onion. And The Onion basically did this story called, parents for the back, you can see it, uh, parents of nasal learners demand an odor-based curriculum. And the real reason I wanted to show you this whole section right here is how important it is from the student's point of view. By the way, this is the actual article. And if you can't see it, there's a picture here of a little girl kind of holding her head looking at a textbook. The caption, by the way, is a nasal learner struggles with an odorless textbook. <laughs> by the way, according to this study, this report, 70% of students would rather smell a term paper than write one. Um, I may have been a little higher than that, actually. Um, but the real thing that I was after here is this one quote. Now imagine students. Here's the thing. Students, one of the primary things for learning is a person has to believe they can learn. Self-efficacy. If there's nothing else in, in, in learning and memory that you ever play a lot of attention to, go read a little bit on self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is the extent to which I persist and work at something when I'm not sure that I can do it. And you need that in education to push things. If I don't believe I can learn from you and I don't believe something can be learned, I shut down and I'm done. Now, take this whole thing we've been talking about or I've been mentioning here. Here's the quote. My 15-year-old daughter, Chloe, couldn't sustain her interest in academics and as a result, she would goof off with her friends and get into trouble. Ooh, a 15-year-old goofing off and getting into trouble. <laughs> Said Michael Sweeney of us, we went in here. Now I realize all those D's and F's did not represent any failure on my daughter's part, but rather her school's failure to provide an appropriate nasal-based curriculum. <laughs> if your student comes up to you and says, you know, I've been trying really hard in class, but I'm a visual learner and you never show any good visuals, so there's no way for me to learn in your class. Or if another person comes up and says, you know, like, I'm totally kinesthetic and everything we do in here is visual, so there's no way I can learn. These students have been told there these modalities, and as a result of being told all this, they come into the learning environment shutting down as soon as they don't get what they want, kind of like this thing here. So one of the things I love to do is talk to my students on the first day of class about learning styles and learning preferences. And all you need to mention to them is that you can read that article, past the article will give you all the information you need really accessible, and you can talk to the students and say, there's lots of different ways of learning information. What you need to do is be careful that you don't always fall back on your learning preference because there's lots of different ways of doing things, but you're also going to have to be able to do things in a lot of different ways. One thing I tell my students is imagine you get a job working for know, a brokerage firm and your boss says, I need a two-page summary on Friday about what you've been doing and, and the accounts you have. Would it be okay if I draw you a picture? <laughs> Most bosses say, no, you may not draw a picture. Could I like build you a model? <laughs> I mean, under those circumstances, I've got to be able to verbally put it down. And so just because I'm a visual learner doesn't mean I can always do visual stuff. So making sure they don't shut down on that is just huge. Okay. Now, processing information. So now I need the whole group to help out with this one. Here's a little, it's, it's, in your, it's in the handouts, at the bottom of page two. Now you could memorize this. It's not that hard. I mean, you could do things like Jabberwocky. Last cerny, flingledob, and pribbon were in the bird link, trepering gloopy cables and gleam, gleaming burly greps. Suddenly a diddy stressle boofed into flingledob's tresk. Pribbing glaped, oh, flingledob, he chifed that diddy stressle was tuning in your grep. Okay, cool, you got that, right? <laughs> if you, as a very smart group, memorize that, and you could, you could memorize that, if you memorize it. Now, here's the critical challenge in teaching. When we want to test whether or not you actually did memorize this, 
we could ask some questions. So don't yell out an answer yet, but let me just ask you, looking, looking at your hand out there, because you can look at the handout on page two, when did Flingledobin, Prib, and Trepin, just a minute, wait for it, when did they trip in? Now, as a group, when was that? So go ahead. Last Cerny. Very good. <laughs> Next one. Don't yell it out yet. Everybody take a quick look. What kind of capels did Flingledobin, Prib, and Trepin? What kind of capels were they? Ready? All right, what kind were they? Go. Bloopy. Bloopy. Very good. Oh, you guys are really good at this. Um, now, what did the Diddy Strezel do to Flingledobe's Trask? Now, wait a minute. So take a look. What did the Diddy Strezel do to Flingledobe's Trask? Ready? He did what? Boofed. boofed. I would take boofed or boofed into. <laughs> and number four, what was Pribbin's reaction? So Pribbin, how did Pribbin react? He did what? Right. He glaped. If it was glapped, by the way, the English people will tell you very quickly. Two Ps, short A. Now, glaped. <laughs> I know. I got told about that one, too. Um, now, the number five, what do you imagine happened next? Not after he glaped, after this paragraph, what do you imagine was the next thing that happened in the story? Ready? It was, all right, wait, we'll go to the next question. Based on the incidents in the story, why do you think Flingledobe and Pribbin went to the bird link? Are they likely to return? Why or why not? Now, if you memorize this stuff and you got as a group, you did really well on the first four. Let's imagine they're all worth 10 points. You got 40 points there. We'll imagine you written a little, you wrote a little bit. I don't have a good grading rubric, bad example. You always have a good grading rubric. But I give you a couple of points on five and a couple of points on six. So you get 40 plus maybe five points total here. You got 45. 45 out of 60 is a 75%. In my class, 75% is a C. So I would say, there's your C. And you know, most of you know how that would end up playing out. Student coming to your office, hey, Dr. Z, uh, do you have a minute? Say, yes, I do. Um, yeah, I just got a C on this test, and I don't get Cs, right? <laughs> There's a little academic trigger in the back of your head that shuts down the automatic response of, you do now. <laughs> Can't do that one. So what you have to go with is, well, let's talk about this a little bit. And what I used to say is, a C represents a good foundation of knowledge. You just have to work a little harder. And that's a general kind of statement. But the problem is, those of you who recognize it already, it's not that. So what's the issue that's going on here? Somebody got a quick response here. What's happening with these questions that would allow a person to just hit the first four so easily and then miss the last two? Yes? No comprehension of content in the first four. Perfect. Yep. Surface learning versus deep learning. learning, deep learning, the content of the materials, and one more here. And a poorly written, that's a very well written exam. <laughs> nope, it could very well be a poorly written exam. You're absolutely right. So there's several things going on here, and you've got them. The biggest issue that's happening, aside from these questions may not be ideal questions, is that surface versus deep understanding, not understanding. Please think through with your students, and have your students do this at times. Bloom's taxonomy is great, but I have my students just hit three levels. I tell them, please look at the exam. If you want to come and talk to me about your grade, that's fine. But here are the three things I want you to look for. Look for basic knowledge questions. Look for applications questions where we're applying something. And look for just understanding questions. Do you understand what's in the question? Yes, there's synthesis questions. There's other things. But just those three. And when the students come to talk to me, I say, what are you primarily missing? And now students will show up and they'll say, you know, I'm doing okay on the knowledge questions. I'm just not getting these comprehension. Or I do okay on comprehension. I do okay on knowledge. I just can't, these, these ones that have application, I don't get it. I do have some students that say, I don't know what you mean by application. I don't know what you mean by comprehension. And we talk that through because it's valuable information. Keep in mind, huge difference about with the understanding part. Capels and burly greps, this could be biochemistry really easily. If it's a topic that students are hearing all this jargon, all these words, and they don't get it, they could be memorizing 90 miles an hour and not knowing what it means. Here's a quick example I've always loved. Um, I did this years ago in, in a quick class I had. I was trying to get across to my students the, the surface versus deeper learning. And I said, there are five great lakes. This is when I was out in Oregon. There are five great lakes that surround Michigan. Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, and Superior. Those are the five great lakes. Of the five Great Lakes, Superior is the deepest. Quiz time. Which of these lakes is the deepest? We'll just pick three. Erie, 
Huron or Superior? And you would all pick Superior, Superior right? Okay. Do you know at this point, it'd be possible that you don't even know what a lake is? You would not need to know what a lake is because over here all I said is there are five great lakes. Here are the names of them. This one's the deepest. Over here I'm saying which one of these is the deepest and you recognize the name again. So what I now do is look through my tests and look through my materials and say, does somebody have to know something to be able to answer this? It's a huge, huge issue. Um, okay. I did want to leave a little bit of time for some questions and stuff, so I want to just hit a couple more quick things here. There's some things that we don't have, like critical challenges. Some of the aspects of teaching and learning, we don't have a lot of control over the students. But if you could get the students to understand some of these things, it's huge. Exercise. Exercise has been demonstrated to be one of the critical, critical components of actually learning. People who exercise regularly, you can process information way better, this is information processing, way better than people who don't exercise. There are lots of things happening with exercise. There's some school districts out there that have tried, by the way, adding exercise programs, elementary schools, with a, um, disruptive problems decreasing by like 80%. Moving up cognitive scores, like two or three standard deviations, by including physical exercise into the program. You know when we don't want to leave any kid behind and we make sure all the tests are really good, the first thing that schools will typically take out of the curriculum? Phys ed. Because they got to study more. So it just, exercising is huge. Sleeping and resting. Um, researchers have found that sleeping and resting is huge. Here's one of my favorite studies, and this was by Medina, had reported on this one. NASA found astronauts who slept for 27 minutes in the afternoon improved their cognitive functioning later that day on tasks by 34% over non-nappers. Take an average of a 27 minute nap and a one third increase in cognitive functioning. So talking through with students, and now by the way, huge mistake at Central Michigan University years ago, Somebody sent an email out, all campus, that said, napping improves cognitive functioning. I was running the teaching center. I walked down the hall and I knew it would happen because I worked with, you have good people here. My people were pains. I walked down the hall and everybody's lights were off and their heads were on their desk. <laughs> and they said, uh, Todd, we were told we must nap in the afternoon. <laughs> so I like that. But getting students to understand exercise, rest, huge. And also, so those are two, two big issues. And by the way, in college, those are things that often, especially around exam time, just go away. And nutrition's huge too. But Crelly 2001, and I didn't mean to read these to you, but I didn't realize the room would be this deep. So let me just go through this quickly. Notes that when a person's brain is sleep deprived, the person may actually feel fully awake and yet the neurons needed for learning and memory shut down. Essentially, the basic functions operate, but complex tasks are not encoded. You can take a person who's exhausted and read a chapter close the book and the next day they would not be able to tell if they've even read that chapter. I mean basic cognitive functions can operate to some extent. Your eyes can go across this, uh, the pages and stuff, but you can't do this. The problem we have now, which is huge, is our brains are never shutting down. So that, again, these are the challenges in teaching. If some of it we can directly control in the classroom, others we have to try to get across to the students. Imagine going back a couple of thousand years and what the life, the day in the life of a human would look like. You know, basically, find food and don't get eaten. Well, there's reproducing too, but I'm from Michigan, we like to talk about that. Um, <laughs> so basically, what you do in the day is you're reproducing, you're finding food, and you're not getting killed, and that's your day. You walk a lot to find food, you're, you're interacting with people, you rarely pull out your iPhones. There are times when you're actually walking along and just having quiet reflection and thinking or just even just not doing something. We fast forward to today. People can wake up at six o'clock in the morning and essentially not be not thinking until they go to bed, you know, midnight, one o'clock maybe. So students could be getting five, six hours of sleep and we would be in there too, by the way, and not have any downtime. So one of the things I love to point out and I think it's, I would point out to you too, but I would have you point it out to your students schedule a little bit of downtime if you have to, or at least recognize when it's in there. There should be a little bit of time every day when you're not thinking. And what that boils down to, by the way, is like not walking and texting at the same time, or walking and, or driving and texting at the same time. Finally, people are all over that in terms of danger. But the issue is we're always kind of processing. By the way, 
I made a claim, and sometimes I like going through these things. I made a claim that one of the things I was concerned about is students leave a classroom now, and instead of thinking about the material, they immediately pull out their phones and say, so what are you doing this weekend? Yeah, me neither. Uh-huh, yeah, that's fine. That used to be reflection time. So one of the things you can tell your students is when you leave the class, spend five, ten minutes just thinking about the class as you're walking along. Huge differences. And as I pointed out to someone once that, that all, the students never do that anymore, I walked out of the building in the middle of this conversation, and I don't think it happens often, but I did hear this. Student coming out of the room saying, hey, mom, what's up? This is the helicopter generation, right? New generation. Hey, mom, what's up? Yeah, I was just in intro psych class. Oh, it's so cool. We did operant conditioning. Yeah, well, actually, what we were looking at is schedules of reinforcement. <laughs> I was thinking, all right, how often does that happen? Someone phoned a friend and talked about the class. I thought that was really cool. All right, um, just a little bit of time. I want to try something else here real quickly with you. Let's see how I can do this one. Perfect. Top of page four. There was another study. I love the pastor stuff. Another one I really love is, is um, Carol Dweck. Carol Dweck has done some great stuff. Imagine for a moment that I have everybody in here go through anagrams. You take these letters. The first one is M-U-G. You take those letters and you twist them around and you make a brand new word. So mug would become... Gum, very good. Night is the next word. Night would be thing. thing. Very good. After you finish this, individually you get your feedback. But basically what happens is this group is told, really well done. You did good. This group is told, you did really well. You must be very smart. And this group is told, you did really well. You must have worked really hard on that. That's all you get. Some of these psych studies, I love them how simple they are. You did well. You must be smart. You must have worked really hard. Then you come back and do a hard list. First word, if you can't see the screen, is marching. The next one is nameless, licensed. These are much harder words. Teaching, oh, what's teaching? Anybody got a word you can get from cheating? Cheating, cheating really good. Okay, <laughs> after you go through this list, and this is the way the research goes, you go through this list, and basically what you say is ouch, ouch, and ouch. Yeah, that was really tricky. Now, self-efficacy. To what extent do you persist when you're faced with failure? If we come back now with another list that's very similar in difficulty to the first lift, list, those with more self-efficacy will work harder than the people with less self-efficacy, the ones who don't believe they can really get it. So they go through this list, and I'm just going to do this quickly. So now for findings, top of page four. If we have this group over here that was told Good for you on the first task. Then the second task, it went bad. How much, did, how well did they do on the third task? And I apologize again, the pill, pillars here in the middle. First trial, this is the number of words correct. We didn't put trial two in here because all we wanted trial two to do was to discourage you. Because what do you do in the face of discouragement? That's why we wanted it in there. So it's trial three. The real issue is trial one to trial three. Now, the next task you would have, and I'm gonna have you do this real quickly, is to take your pens and draw in a line for the middle group, the ones that were told, oh, you must have worked, or you must be really smart, and the, oh, you must have worked really hard. Now, people were randomly placed into the three groups. After they randomly placed into the three groups, they went through this task, and now just draw your lines in for your effort group and your smart group. So go ahead and just do that real fast on your charts. And I'll tell you why I do this. I do this in my psych class a lot. So you just have to put one line. There's trial one is on the left and trial three is on the right. Just draw a line across for effort and a line across that would be um, smart. All right, all right. Now, and literally we've got like 10 minutes and we're supposed to be done here. So um, turn to one person near you and just look at theirs and chat really like literally for 30 seconds to see if it's close or if they were even able, able to do it. Was it close? ways away.
All right, for the sake of timing, I'm going to stop here. Um, so basically, there's, I, I, whenever I'm teaching my classes now, instead of just saying, here are the findings for my studies, or here's the, here's the result of something, oftentimes I put something up there, set up the scenario, and say, now, what do you, first step, you make a prediction. You come up with something, and then turn to your neighbor or a group of neighbors, whatever, and compare what you came up with. The huge reason for doing that, by the way, and there's think pair shares, there's lots of things, but if we don't have people compare it with their neighbors, it's amazing how many times when you just put the findings up there, the regular cognitive response is, oh yeah, that's about what I would have figured. No matter what it is, oh yeah, that's about what I thought. How many states are there in the United States? I'm thinking there's 32. Well, there's 50 states. Yeah, 32, yeah, that's about what I was thinking. <laughs> so, you know, that just always kind of adapts to it. When you draw something and, or write it down and then it could be one sentence. What is one way to summarize this in five words or pick three adjectives that would do this? Turn to your neighbor, what'd you come up with? Immediately there's a quick discussion about it. Um, one of the reasons I do this one is I want to see if people understand the graphing part. I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect all of you to because I had never talked about graphing and line graphs and things and some of you haven't actually tried to draw one of your own for years. <laughs> Metacognition, if I had said, do you guys all understand a line graph and I showed you the end here? Almost everybody in the room would say, yep. If instead I say, draw this part out. There's a lot of people who started out by putting their pens down saying, well, wait a minute, I don't even know where to start. That's getting you to understand, I need to work at this. So getting the students to do something, and I'm skipping ahead to the metacognition stuff, getting them to do something will demonstrate whether they know it or not more than them, their, their own prediction of if they know it. I mentioned that it's randomly assigned groups, which means all of them should start right at this point. So every line should originate roughly from this point. If you have a line down here and a line up there, then that wouldn't be randomly assigned groups. It would be very unusual to have that happen. So by the way, when you're looking around, oh, I'm just curious too, how many of you, when you raise your hands, if you would please, how many of you, when you looked at your neighbors, thought, wow, that was very similar to what I had? Raise your hand. Okay. How many looked at your neighbors and thought, ooh, that's quite a bit different than what I had? Raise your hand real fast. All right, so it's about two-thirds, one-third. Two-thirds was different. So the point is, get that out there. Um, by the way, there's something in psychology called a false consensus effect. And it's when people believe that everybody else in the room think very similar to the way they think. So if they think a certain thing would happen, you wouldn't believe how many people will say, oh, well, it's obvious. You know what we all think is. It's like, okay, so you do these comparisons and you see differences. By the way, the group that's told, good for you, you did well, or you, yeah, you just did well, tends to do about the same after a difficult task. The group that's told, good for you, you worked really hard on that, didn't you? Then has a face as a difficult task actually does better afterwards. And of course, you can tell by the spacing on the graph, the group that's told, good for you, you must be smart, does significantly worse. Smart, according to Dweck and her colleagues, smartness is an entity. If you believe you have the smartness, then you persist and work at something. But if you don't believe you have the smartness, why put any energy into it? So when you have individuals who say, oh, I don't do math, what that really boils down to is, there is something called mathematics that is an entity. I don't possess it. And because I don't possess it, it makes no, no sense for me to put any energy into it. Therefore, I'm just going to step back and ignore it. So I don't even try it. Given speeches, yeah, I don't do good speeches. Um, presentation or papers, uh, I don't write good papers. Again, the math, oh, I don't do science, oh, I'm not great at science courses. As soon as a person says that to you, please, please keep in mind that if they've been told in the past, oh, you're a natural, you're really good at science, and then they face an obstacle, it demonstrates that, oops, maybe not. So it's a really, really big point, and I guess the one I want to kind of almost leave you with, I got one little quick thing, but this is huge. When a student says to you, I don't do math, the immediate response I have right now is, oh, really, which kind? And what the students will do is look at me and say, well, what do you mean? I'll say, well, which kind of math? Is it algebra you have trouble with? Is it geometry? Is it like trig? Is it calculus? What do you have trouble with? They say, oh, just math in general. I say, oh, like you can't add? That's sad. Like two plus three, you can't do that? I say, no, I can add. OK, so you can do adding, but you can't do any of the other math. Right. right. Like subtracting. You can't subtract either? Well, I can, okay, I can add, subtract, multiply, and divide, all right? Leave me alone. But I can't do the rest of math. And what happens pretty soon is you start to get them to understand, you know what I'm really not good at is algebra. Say, okay, now we can work at algebra, but don't shut down at the rest. Um, same thing with um, speeches. 
I've had students say, I can't give a speech. I say, really? Never? Nope. They say, well, tell me why you can't give speeches. <laughs> I love to do this. <laughs> well, because, Dr. Z, in my past, I have tried to give speeches. And when I've done speeches, I've been told I'm very poor at it. I get very, very nervous when speaking in front of others and blah, 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 blah. And when they stop, I say, how big of audiences freak you out? Any size. I say, really, even one? Because you just gave a really good persuasive speech on why you can't give speeches. <laughs> Write that up. Give it to the class. You got an A. So the concept there is be careful when they say, I don't possess the entity. But also don't feed into this. If you say to your child, children, if you've got a two-year, not two-year-old, six-year-old, and you say, wow, look at that math. You are a natural at math. You are setting a student who has a proclivity of doing well at math by saying you're a natural at math to someday fail a math test. And their response will be, turns out I'm not good at math after all. And that person will flip all the way around. Child prodigies rarely end up being really, really good adults in those areas because they don't really work at it and practice it. When they face adversity, they're in trouble. Um, yeah, multitasking, oh, that's terrible. Uh, <laughs> One last thing, I got three minutes here. I'm just gonna do this um, for questions. I will have time for, I'm gonna be around all day, so I'm hopeful we can do some questions. This is the last, I have some other things here. This is the last one that I think is really, really important. I just wanna point out here. So this study, I love this study by Carpick. Carpick and again, Rodiger. If you just go with the names of people and search them, they're doing some really neat stuff. So here's the study. Students are given five minutes to read a passage. They read it, that's study. Then they read the passage again, that's study. They read the passage again, that's a study. And they read the passage again, that's study. So they've read the passage four times. Then they take a quiz over it. They get 83% correct. Another group, study, 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 practice quiz. Now here's what's bizarre. Practice quiz, no feedback on the practice quiz. And then a different quiz five minutes later, they score 78% right. A little less because, of course, they study a little less. Next group, they read the passage one time. Practice quiz, no feedback. Different practice quiz, no feedback. Different practice quiz, no feedback. And the reason they don't get feedback is if I gave them feedback or if Carpet gave them feedback, they'd be teaching them something. What we're just saying is bringing it up, answering the questions, going on. Study, test, 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 no feedback, then the practice or the actual test, and they score like 73% right. The really scary thing is you come back a week later. Here's your study, 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 study group. They've lost about half. That's actually not bad. Most times you look at most stuff, it's, uh, it's about right. 50, 60% of the material is gone a week later. That's the way our brains are wired. But what I really love are these other two groups. This study, test, test, test group, actually the decrement is very small, but look at the difference here. This is massive difference. Now the axis is broken over here, but for the group that's the study, test, 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 they've gone from about 72 down to about 65% correct a week later. I'm going to stop with this, with thinking about this concept. What's being done here is that they're practicing at retrieval. And there's some really good evidence coming out of how effective tests are for teaching material. They're great for assessing if they're done well, but for teaching material, if I have to pick the, the deepest lake in North America and I kind of know what the lakes are, and I don't know what test question you're going to ask or anything, and um, then I get a question that says Tahoe, Superior, Crater, and Champlain. And now I have to pick the deepest lake in North America. If I have to start saying, think about how this works, well, Tahoe. Tahoe is really deep, and that's the one over at the border of uh, California and Nevada, and I know that's really deep. Uh, let's see, Superior, now that's one of the Great Lakes, and I know that none of the Great Lakes are in the deepest lakes in North America, so that can't be it. I'm actually processing material right now. I'm pulling stuff out from long-term memory, and I'm thinking about Lake Superior and Lake Tahoe, and every time you do that, it reinforces that information. So really good written multiple choice questions can actually increase learning by practicing at retrieval. So there's some really neat stuff in there, plus just this concept of pulling it out. The first president of the United States, everyone has pulled that out of memory so many times that it's just there. The third president of the United States, yeah, we haven't reached back and grabbed that one as often. So what we want to do is have students practice at retrieving material. The reason I say that, and I'm ending with this, group work does that because they have to pull material out and use it. Practice tests do that. 
um, having homework assignments, having all kinds of different things, flip chart or um, note cards and other things. Whatever you can do to get them to practice at retrieval is just huge. Um, I'm right at time, so I'm going to stop there. If you have questions, you can hang around just a second, although we have other activities going on. But I'm here until 2 o'clock. If you do have burning questions, by all means, you can do that. If you want to email me, if I, I skipped like a couple of slides, if it really bugs you that I slipped those, just send me a quick email. My email's on the front of this handout. Yep, good. I have the coolest alias. I, I was so glad to be able to get that. It's Todd Z at UNC. So it's easy enough to remember. But I hope you've picked up some things you can use in your classes, and I hope you have a fabulous, fabulous day. But I'm going to stop here. Thank you.